This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. As you all know, Master Brewers is a nonprofit organization. You probably also realize that it's expensive to produce shows like the Master Brewers podcast every week. If you're a vendor, please consider sponsoring the Master Brewers podcast. It'll cost you less than you probably spent to sponsor that last district meeting, and your message will reach the thousands of brewers who tune in each week. Click contact from masterbrewerspodcast.com to learn more. And I pulled IPAs and, you know, Imperial IPAs. And of course, you know, I, I see the diastole average for those beers is much higher than, than the rest. So we, we do believe there is that change of um, fermentable sugars getting eaten up by the yeast and causing some secondary fermentation because of dry hopping. This week on the show, we explore the topic of dry hopping's correlation with diacetyl. You'll hear about the work White Labs has done to explore this phenomenon and where you can go to see their data. I'm Kara Taylor. I'm our senior lab manager from White Labs in San Diego. You've been working on getting to the bottom of something that a lot of us brewers have observed over the years but couldn't explain. How did you first get interested in dry hopping's correlation with diacetyl? I had just found that I was drinking a lot of double IPAs and IPAs several years ago and finding that every time I ordered one, it had diacetyl in it, um, which is a compound that I just really despise in beer. Even the most <laughs> Me too. Minimal amount. I'm very sensitive. <laughs> um, Chris White and I used to get in arguments and he would pretend there was diacetyl and things and I would like try to figure out if it actually had it and it would be the things like coffee or <laughs> he didn't believe me how sensitive I was. <laughs> um, but I, so then I started looking at um, some data that we, uh, we do something called big QC day. Um, and that's basically people are allowed to send in their samples for a reduced price. Um, and they tell us the style and so we can analyze some of that data uh, by style, and we were able, you know, to look at diacetyl levels. And I pulled IPAs and you know imperial IPAs, and of course, you know, I, I see the diacetyl average for those beers is much higher than than the rest. So I kind of from there wanted to see, you know, what was going on. Kara, I remember when you presented some of the early work on this subject at a district Mid Atlantic meeting. I don't know five or so years ago. Uh, how about giving us an overview of those original studies and what you found out then? So, yeah, when I when I first started doing that project, you know, I was fairly young in the industry. I'd probably worked, a, you know, three or four years. Um, and so I, you know, I, at first I had this notion of like you're adding dry hop, you're, you're dry hopping beers and yeast is, you know, falling out of solution, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, we've got all this excess diacetyl. And I, you know, I, I quickly did some Imhoff cone experiments and was like, oh, clearly that's not happening. We've got a, a lot of nucleation sites happening, a lot of churning. Um, that is definitely not happening. Um, um, you know, so I was basically at that point just sort of testing out some theories. And so at the end of that, I didn't really have a lot of conclusive knowledge. Um, but I knew how important this information was because, um, you know, if you Googled diacetyl and dry hopping, my name was coming up and I think I was getting an email, you know, I told Devin maybe once a week with someone going, do you have anything new? Do you have any more findings? And of course I said, no, I haven't had time. I'm sorry. Um, and then Devin was able to sort of, you know, pick it up from there. Cool. Well, I think it's probably worth a quick refresher on diacetyl metabolism. How about taking a minute to talk about diacetyl's precursor, how and where it's converted, and what diacetyl levels should look like throughout a normal fermentation? 
Hi, uh, my name is Devin Tani. I'm the analytical lab specialist here at White Labs in uh, San Diego, California. Diacetyl formation is a natural uh, byproduct of uh, fermentation. It's usually created through um, <clears throat> amino acid production. Um, so this is a usual uh, metabolism, right? Metabolites, uh, yeast trying to form um, amino acids to help build healthy yeast, um, sustain life. Um, so um, diacetyl, its precursor, alpha-acetolactate, is actually also a precursor to some of these amino acids, such as like valine. Um, this alpha-acetolactate is able to... Um, go outside the cell walls inside inside the beer and just float around um and through uh, chemical change ph change temperature change this alpha acetolactate is able to be converted into diacetyl and that's when you have a problem um diacetyl usually spikes during that exponential phase with uh, lots of propagation um you also see that rise in acetaldehyde as well so usually to combat this problem, uh, a lot of breweries do a diacetyl rest or a D rest where um, the temperature is risen to give more activity for the yeast cells and um, terminal gravity is already reached. So the yeast cells have eaten all the fermentable sugars already. So that way uh, the yeast could go to town on your unwanted off flavors such as diacetyl and then they are able to reabsorb um that diastol and turn it into a flavorless compound known as acetonin. All right. So the real question here is how and why can dry hopping affect this process? Devin, you presented some new work at the 2017 Master Brewers Conference in Atlanta. What approach did you guys take this time around? So that's correct. Um, so the approach we took this time around is um, after Kara's uh, research, uh, we know some uh, missing um, data points, so we want to try to look more at uh, general data points as well as um, real-life applications of this dry hopping as well. Your first step was to do some lab-scale trials. Tell us about those. Okay, so those lab-scale trials, again, were um, mainly to um, replicate like uh, Keras trials just on uh, my own scale. Um, so those lab skills pretty much uh, were just those uh, four one liter uh, batches of, I, I believe, a uh, 15 plate of wort. And then we started dry hopping it before it uh, reached terminal gravity just to see um, a natural process of what happens when you dry hop before hitting terminal gravity. Um, and what we did see was that natural progression of the diastole rise from the lag and exponential phase, as well as the decrease um, during that de rest. Um, but as you saw, um, I believe if you uh, look at uh, my presentation, the, some of the diastole at uh, during dry hopping was already over the limit and just uh, went even past that, showing that um, there was already diastole before dry hopping and then also increase, but we do not know if that increase was due to the dry hopping or if it was still part of the active fermentation. You also worked with some San Diego-based breweries that dry hop. Uh, I guess it must have been a real challenge to find some of those. Are, are there any breweries in San Diego that don't dry hop? Uh, um, Probably not, huh? It, not, not a lot, yeah. Usually, because we are in the lovely uh, Miramar location, so we had our uh, bountiful picking of people that wanted to help out. Great. Are, uh, can you tell me, are dry hopping methods all over the place in San Diego, or are there any common themes? Um, so, that, again, there was a... It was hard to determine that. We had um, nine uh, participants help us out on this uh, project. Um, so, with such a small sample size, it is hard to um, dictate similarities and differences. Yes, I did see... Uh, certain similarities between like dry hop temperatures 
with a few breweries, but again, um, the processes uh, did seem to differ depending on the scale of the brewery as well as um, how big their fermenters were. Coming up. We do believe there is that change of um, fermentable sugars getting eaten up by the yeast and causing some secondary fermentation because of dry hopping. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. District Northern California holds its technical conference February 2nd at Sierra Nevada and Chico. The District St. Paul Minneapolis February meeting and scholarship drive is February 8th at Surly Brewing. District St. Louis meets at O'Fallon Brewery on February 15th. The Fundamentals of Cut and Stack Labeling webinar is February 19th. District Rocky Mountain meets at AB in Fort Collins February 22nd. District Philly will be at Trogues February 23rd. District Milwaukee and the Wisconsin Brewers Guild hold a joint technical conference March 1st and 2nd at Badger State Brewing. District Mid-South meets at Mill Creek in Nashville March 2nd and 3rd. District Northern Rockies meets in Bozeman March 2nd. The District Midwest Spring Meeting is at Mad Tree Brewing March 10th. Districts Michigan and St. Louis both meet March 15th. And check out the speaker lineup for the 2018 Eastern Technical Conference March 23rd and 24th in Atlantic City. View the full count of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. Okay, so you grab samples from, I believe, something like 14 brews from nine different breweries. I'm not sure if I got that right, but what did you test for, and at what points were these samples taken? Um, so these samples were taken all throughout uh, the ferment, uh, the dry hopping process. So um, this was dictated by when the brewery actually did dry hop. So again, that's why that lab skill was important, because... Most of the breweries I uh, did dry hop after reaching terminal gravity. Um, but this, all the samples were taken all the way from when they first, uh, before they ever dry hop, the sample was taken to get a baseline. And then um, the day of dry hopping, and then every other day until they finally did cold crash that beer. Um, some of the sample points that we did um, take included um, the temperature of the fermenter. Um, we did some micro to make sh- rule out any uh, contamination issues. Uh, we did the cell count of how many yeast cells were in suspension and the viability of, the, of those yeast cells, the gravity of that beer, the pH, as well as uh, di- the diacetyl, the precursor, so alpha lactate and um, the total diacetyl. So that precursor converted into diacetyl as the total diacetyl. And how many of those samples exhibited this increased diacetyl post dry hopping post dry hopping phenomenon? Um, I believe of all the yeah, I believe it was fourteen samples. I believe. Out of those 14, we did see at least three to four exhibit some spike in diacetyl. All right. What else did those uh, samples have in common? Okay. The common similarities between um, those three samples was we did find a minuscule drop in that gravity. Um, it was bigger than any of the, of the other uh, drops in the 14 samples we looked at, um, this drop in gravity um, was seen through our um, Anton Parr alkalizer, and it was very, very minuscule. Um, but because of that drop in gravity, we saw there was that probable cause of some that drop in fermentable sugars is causing <clears throat> more uh, fermentation to take place. And that was uh, verified also by seeing a rise in that alpha acetyl lactate. Um, these three samples also did have 
a bigger rise in precursor after dry hopping. Any other big takeaways there? Um, because I, I guess because there was that small drop in gravity, we wanted to uh, have a second verification of there was that more uh, fermentable sugars being eaten up. To do that, we actually um, ran the samples on our HPLC through both our simple sugar method as well as a carbohydrate method to see if there was any um, loss of that gravity of sugars being eaten. Um, because uh, these samples were already at terminal gravity, um, the simple sugars actually did not, uh, were under our detection limit. But when we look at the carbohydrates, which are like the dextrins, the maltotriols, the glycerols, um, we did see a drop of those uh, multiple chain carbohydrates um, dropping down sort of like the uh, gravity. So we, we do believe there is that change of um, fermentable sugars getting eaten up by the yeast and causing some secondary fermentation because of dry hopping. Do you guys have any have any additional updates since Atlanta? Have you done any any more work on this at all? Um, yeah, I mean we haven't we haven't right now, but since um, Atlanta, we're getting tons of inquiries um, just about the data and about the PowerPoint. So um, I think that it's you know it, it's definitely an important topic. Um, it seems like there's some other people in the industry also kind of. Uh, trying to to look at it also, so I'm hope hopefully there'll be there'll be some uh, more collaboration and you know more data to present in the future for sure. Okay, yeah. Um, going off of that, like uh, under other people in the industry, uh, like also researching this topic, I believe um, I recently read that in the Brewers Association, and um, one of the grants was to uh, Dr. Thomas Shellhammer. And I believe he's uh, looking more into those um, dextrin-reducing enzymes in hops and trying to correlate uh, which hops have more of this enzyme that is somehow uh, breaking down those unfermentables and the fermentable sugars. Do you guys have any advice for brewers that are that are ex- experiencing issues you know how should they go about adjusting their process to avoid diacetyl that's coming from dry hopping uh one you know i i definitely see a lot of people that aren't checking before fermentations you know before they're chilling before they're transferring to the bright tank so that's step one is to actually you know do some forced um some forced fermentations um or so you know and and basically check if you have that precursor and then also um you know just making sure that 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 fermentation is dry and that most of the you know those fermentables are are consumed yeah um i uh concur on that just uh anyone could easily do a forced diacetyl test it's uh super easy and efficient you just have to have a water bath make sure you heat up your sample uh, to convert any of that precursor, make sure all your yeast is off that beer. And then all your, um, once you heat up your sample, you, all your precursor is going to get converted into diacetyl. So you, again, you're going to have that total diacetyl. And then it's easy to, um, through a sensory panel, determine if your beer has diacetyl or not. Again, like any small brewery is able to do um, this forced diacetyl test. Sure thing. I've heard of a lot of people that just will put the set the sample on top of their hot liquor tank. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science. <laughs> that was Kara Taylor and Devin Tani here on the Master Brewers podcast. If you'd like to take a closer look at their data, the 2017 Master Brewers Conference proceedings are available from the store menu at mbaa.com. <laughs> As you all know, Master Brewers is a nonprofit organization. You probably also realize that it's expensive to produce shows like the Master Brewers podcast every week. If you're a vendor, please consider sponsoring the Master Brewers podcast. It'll cost you less than you probably spent to sponsor that last district meeting, and your message will reach the thousands of brewers who tune in each week. 
Click contact from masterbrewerspodcast.com to learn more.